This is John Hammond, the guy who used to record Billie Holiday from the years 1933 off and on through 1940. And with me is Dan Morgenstern, the editor of Downbeat magazine. And we're about to talk of the new album, Billie Holiday album, that's being put out of the songs that Diana Ross sings in the movie, Lady Sings the Blues. I thought we might talk a little bit, Dan, about some of the sessions that are included here, the titles, and maybe you could ask me some questions about some of the sessions, and maybe I can remember some of the things that happened. Well, I guess the earliest one uh, on the record is uh, a famous session that produced uh, What a Little Moonlight Can Do and Miss Brown to You. And that was actually one of the first Billie Holiday records that I ever acquired, and it's been one of my favorites ever since. Well, actually, it was the only the second record she ever made in her life because she had made Two Sides with Benny Goodman in 1933, and this was the first one that she made in that little band that I got together around Teddy Wilson in June of 1935. It was, this was a session that I can remember practically every second of because we got together six guys who had literally never played with each other before. There was Teddy Wilson on piano, there was John Kirby on bass, there was Cozy Cole, who was just down from Buffalo with Jonah Jones uh, and uh, Stuff Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, Cozy was on drums. John Trueheart, uh, Chick Webb's guitar player. Uh, then there were the three horns of Benny Goodman on clarinet, a very unwilling Benny Goodman, I might add. <laughs> Roy Eldridge on trumpet, and Ben Webster in his first uh, recording session in the East. It was absolute dynamite because here were these seven guys with tunes that were not the best. <clears throat> on that session, actually, the, probably the best known tune, the only plug tune was I Wished on the Moon which was from the big broadcast of 1936, which was a pleasant ballad. What a Little Moonlight Can Do was considered a dog by everybody, including its publisher. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> Miss Brown to You was something that was absolutely unknown. Uh, but um, I guess Teddy and Harry Gray, who was the musical director of Brunswick at the time, picked that one out. But uh, I tell you, Billy Holiday's singing and the instrumentalists improvising made three of these tunes an abs absolute classics. And in a sense, I guess it sort of set the pattern for uh, future recordings by Billy under your uh, direction. Well it, well, it did, because I tell you, I, I, I did something which I'm really rather sorry about. I proved to, to Brunswick how cheaply good records could be made, <laughs> because there were no arrangements, uh, there were no orchestrations, no paper to worry about. Uh, there were seven musicians who got union scale and that was it. Uh, plus a vocalist who got paid a flat fee per side. However, there was practically no jazz being recorded in 1935. I mean, the record business was really broke. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only possible things that could, ch could help record business was the jukebox business, which was just starting. Uh, K-Pot had just come out with its first jukebox the year before, and in many locations, particularly in bars catering to black people, uh, there were these jukeboxes that played 12 selections, and they were looking for material that would make their customers drop nickels into the jukeboxes. And uh, the Teddy Wilson, Billy Holiday records uh, were the best thing that Brunswick had at that time. When did you first hear Billy? I first heard Billy in early 1933, when she was working at Monette Moore's gin mill on 133rd Street. She was 17. Uh, she had 
been scarred by life already. She was up from Baltimore maybe a year or so before. She was the daughter of a guitar player whom I had known, Clarence Holliday, who was the uh, guitar player with Fletcher Henderson's band. Her singing almost changed my musical tastes and my musical life because she was the first girl singer I'd ever come across who actually sang like an improvising jazz genius. She was an extension almost of a Louis Armstrong. The way she sang around a melody, her uncanny harmonic sense, and her sense of, uh, of lyric content was just unbelievable for a 17-year-old girl. And her time must have been something oh, it was it, or it was something else. She was always pretty lucky about the musicians she had around her. The first uh, piano player I ever heard her work with was a girl called Dot Hill. And, and Dot was superb. And the next piano player she had was perhaps the greatest outside of Teddy Wilson that she ever worked with, a guy by the name of Bobby Henderson, who died a couple of years ago up in Albany, but who was, was absolutely one of the fine, uh, fine people in Billy's life. He was her first real boyfriend mm -hmm. and, a, and a gentleman every which way and a wonderful musician. And they worked together off and on uptown for about three years until actually Billy uh, finally joined Basie's band the, the spring of 1937. And that sort of made her uh famous uh, in a sense because she was exposed to a larger she audience. She was exposed to a much larger audience, but already some of her records had, uh, had, had made it with more than just a jazz following. Because in, uh, I guess it was in 1936, we recorded I Cried For You. And Billy only sang one chorus on these records, you know. Or maybe she'd come back for a, a final eight bars or something. But usually, uh, she was just, uh, I Cried For You starts with the most beautiful Johnny Hodges chorus possible. And um, this record sold something like 15,000, which was a giant hit for Brunswick in those days. In those days, days was it a lot. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was a giant hit. And uh, I mean, most records that made money sold around three or four thousand. I mean, it was just terrible to, to think of what uh, record sales were like in those uh, terrible days when radio had wiped out the record business. I guess at a session uh, just around that time, she did Mean to Me, which was uh, uh, one of the first with uh, Lester Young. Well, and of course. That was quite a, a famous relationship. Yes, yeah, well, this, is, this was one of the things. We, we had so much luck in these sessions with, with Teddy uh, and Billy because who the side men were depended very much on what good bands were in town. And if Ellington was in town, you'd find a Johnny Hodges or a Harry Carney or, uh, some Cody, of the, Williams. or a Cody yeah. Williams or some of the other great uh, sidemen would do, backing uh, Billy and Teddy. But when Basie came to New York in October of 1936, this is when everything changed. Because when Billy got together with three people, Lester Young, Buck Clayton, Freddie Green, and I have to say two others who were terribly important, Walter Page and uh, Joe Jones. This set Billy as probably uh, the most unique jazz singer of her generation. There was an interplay between Lester Young and Buck and Billy that was, you know, unique in music. I don't believe we've ever gotten this kind of interplay in the years since Billy's prime, you know, in the 30s and 40s. Yeah, it was a remarkable, remarkable unity of conception there. One thing that uh, strikes me when I listen to the records that Billy made during those days is that in, in later years, of course, uh, her life became very tragic and uh, her songs uh, and became, often became sad. But these songs, uh, the ones that she recorded in the 30s, are basically happy tunes. And uh, There are only a couple of ex exceptions in, on, on this album. One is the first title, God Bless the Child. 
That, this is a very interesting song. Of course, God Bless the Child, Who's Got His Own, was a phrase that Billy got from her grandmother. But the whole structure of the song, both lyrics and musically, were by Arthur Herzog, a marvelous guy who's still living in Detroit and who has never gotten proper credit mm -hmm. uh, for it. He, uh, Arthur was a good songwriter and a good poet, and he loved Billy's singing and uh, was a no of enormous help in this day because he had a little uh, flat on 7th Avenue between 13th and 14th Street uh, in New York, and I was down there the night that Billy and Arthur worked this thing out. I don't really uh, mind Billy getting sort of sole credit uh, for it uh, because uh, Billy, you know, des deserved everything she could get. But actually, Arthur Herzog should have a lion's share of the credit for this wonderful song. The other, the other two, that actually two more rather gloomy songs. One is Gloomy Sunday, uh, which was supposed, according to the press agents of that period, to cause waves of suicide throughout Europe when it was heard. Hungarian suicide. Hun song, Hungarian right? suicide. And the other was uh, Fanny Bryce's classic, My Man. Uh, but Billy, every, everything that on this album that Billy sang, uh, All of Me, You've Changed, Them, Their Eyes, uh, Miss Brown to You, which we've mentioned before, I Cried for You and the Man I Love. She made masterpieces of them all. This is um, these are among the greatest sides that she ever made, and I think we ought to have a lot of fun having this record listened to by people who only know of Billie Holiday through the movie. 